On July 12, 1917, the army of Duan Chiure's Anhui clique marched into Beijing, ostensibly to save the Republic abolished in the two-week-long restoration of the Qing Empire. But while the monarchists collapsed easily, and Duan and Feng Guozhong returned to office as premier and president respectively, the damage done to the Republic was permanent. The aftermath of the Montreux Restoration saw China's final collapse into warlordism, which would provide an opportunity for the return of someone who has kept the sidelines for the last few episodes, Sun Zhangshan, and the Constitutional Protection Movement. I'm Emma, and this is Communist Histories. In this sixth episode of my Chinese Revolution series, we're finally returning to some straightforward political history. Warlords were military leaders with almost total control over their territory, supported by a personally loyal army. They came from a variety of backgrounds. While many had been commanders in the Republic's Beiyang army, some were legally appointed governors, who had stopped taking orders from the government, while others were just up-jump bandits. While some warlords hoped to maintain their independence, the majority do seem to have realized that their situation was temporary, and that reunification was inevitable. This encouraged the biggest warlords to fight among themselves to establish unification on their own terms, while in the smaller warlords, it encouraged very short-term thinking. If producing a stable new state isn't possible, why not use your position to get very wealthy right now? And generally, they got very wealthy. Zhang Zongchang, the dogmeat general, was famously known as the Three Don't Knows, as he didn't know how much money he had, how many concubines he had, or how many men were in his army. Most warlords supported themselves through the taxes that the government would normally have received. Often this was boosted by a heavy reliance upon opium production. Britain's opium monopoly in the early 19th century brought in a lot of money for the empire, and absolutely led to massive levels of addiction in China. But Chinese merchants were no fools. They weren't just going to sit back and let the British dominate the industry. And it didn't take long before opium was being grown in China as well. By the late 19th century, this contributed to a loss of revenue for the British, which, combined with the growth of other industries in India, encouraged the British Parliament to consider ending the trade. Finally, in 1907, they agreed to the Qing government to phase out opium sales for a 10-year period, during which the Qing would crack down on opium at home. This actually had some real results. By 1913, almost all legal importation had ended, and some Chinese provinces reported zero opium usage. Of course, some provinces saw, saw almost no change, but considering Qing surveys in 1906 estimated 30 to 40 percent of the population smoked, it was a step forward. For the first years of the Republic of China, Yuan Shikai maintained the Qing's drug policies, and the trend continued. But as the government weakened, the policies couldn't be enforced, and the warlords saw an opportunity. Over half the income was from opium. According to the Guangxi government record, total income for 1932 was $31 million, of which opium income was $15,880,000. At a rate of $500 per thousand ounces, this would mean that over 30 million ounces of opium moved through Guangxi. Huang Xiaosheng, Guangxi governor. Warlords intentionally set taxes so high that peasants could only pay by selling opium. It became a safer move subsistence-wise to sell opium to buy food than to grow food themselves. Obviously, while this was a smart move for every individual, collectively it meant nobody was growing food, which contributed to famines. When farmers couldn't be pressured to grow opium financially, they were forced to directly. In Puchan, Huayan, and Guangzhou counties, warlord soldiers shot, decapitated, and burned alive peasants who opposed collection of opium taxes. By 1922, opium usage had returned to the 19th century levels, and China produced 80% of the world's opium. But not all warlords are petty strongmen. Yan Shishan, who controlled Shanxi province from 1911 until after World War II, 
was known as the model governor, promoting a, a number of social reforms, including the abolition of foot binding, modest improvements in education for women, and some measures to improve, to improve public health. Probably most importantly, he kept the province out of the wars going on all around it. And that's something that's important to remember. While I'm focusing largely on the biggest warlords because they had the most influence, looking just at them can give the impression that China was much more stable than it actually was. China wasn't just broken up into a few smaller countries during this time. There were scores of small warlords, many of whom were part of larger cliques, but who still had total control of their own territories. And the ten years of the warlord era saw hundreds of small wars between them. But we do need to focus on the big cliques. I introduced them in episode 3, but to recap a bit, the biggest clique of all was the Anhui, led by Duan Chire. Duan and his closest allies were born in Anhui province, but the clique itself was centered in Beijing, supporting Duan's premiership. Anhui's political wing was called the Anfu Club, and its financial wing, the New Communications Clique. But for simplicity's sake, I'll just be calling it all Anhui. Its chief rival was the Jili Clique, led by President Feng Guozhang. That rivalry had been one of the sparks of the Mont Restoration. But after Duan and Feng returned to power, they tried to come to an agreement and rule together. There was only one thing disturbing this new regime, the parliament. Parliament still contained many Guomindang members, even though the Guomindang itself had been largely defunct since Sung Zhongshan fled to Japan after the Second Revolution in 1913. Duan blamed these members for the parliamentary stalemate that led to the Manchu Restoration. So after he returned to power, he decreed that the Restoration had invalidated the parliament, and a new one would be chosen under his control. As it turned out, the Guomindang wasn't quite as dead as people had thought. In Tokyo 1914, Sun Zhongshan renamed his party to the Gumingdang, the Revolutionary Party. This new party would be controlled by a director, Sun, who members would swear an oath of personal loyalty to. It was a hierarchical and secret organization, not a political party. So the members who weren't on board with the changes left and continued calling themselves Guomindang. The Gumingdang produced a new leadership. Hu Hanmin, ex-governor of Guangdong, took charge of propaganda in Shanghai. San Francisco-born Liao Zhongkai headed the party finance bureau. And the biggest financial backer was Charlie Song. Song's daughter, Ai Ling, married the wealthy industrialist H. H. Kong, bringing him into the party. Shortly afterwards, her sister, Ching Ling, married Sun. In the years after the Second Revolution, the party quietly built itself up. It didn't receive much support on the mainland and had a mixed relationship with the growing new culture movement. The nationalism of the movement obviously resonated, but to Sun, many of the traditions the new culture movement attacked were an integral part of the nation. The anti-politic mood of the early movement meant that students avoided all parties, and once they got more political, they also got more radical than Sun. <laughs> Duan's replacement of Parliament didn't do much materially. Parliament had already been weakened to the point of irrelevance. Sun certainly had given up on it already. But it was a great propaganda moment, and Sun took the opportunity to decry the warlord government. He contacted an old Guomindang ally and leader of the National Protection Alliance, Tang Jiao, who was still head of the Yunnan clique. Tang in turn contacted another ally from the National Protection War, Lu Rongting, head of the Guangxi clique. Lu had recently annexed Guangdong province, and they decided to offer to the Gumingdong as a base. Sun Zhongshan moved south to Guangzhou, taking along with him 100 of the Guomindang members of parliament who Duan had expelled. The parliament legitimized this move, and elected Sun Grand Marshal, or Generalissimo. Tong Jiao and Lu Rongting were made marshals, and the three provinces declared themselves the Constitutional Protection Movement, with the aim to overthrow warlord rule and re-establish the original Republican Constitution. Almost immediately, they sent their armies north. Duan quickly responded, and the armies met in Hunan. Hunan was divided up amongst many small warlords, and when they saw government forces arriving, they feared for their sovereignty 
and join up with your CPM. Worse for Duan, the Jilly clique opposed the move. The Jilly clique said the government should negotiate with Sun to avoid another civil war. Feng Guozhang may have been hoping that by posi positioning himself as a mediator, he could elevate his status as president, as the only person who could lead both North and South. Either way, the tenuous alliance between the Anhui and Jili cliques broke down. The warlord nature of the government's armies proved disastrous. Generals' power derived from the strength of their armies, so the commanders weren't willing to risk losing their troops as long as Beijing's orders were divided. The attack stalled, and only encouraged more Hunanese warlords to revolt. The army suffered a major defeat, and in November 1917, Duan was forced to resign as premier in disgrace. The Jili clique tried to negotiate a peace deal, but the South had almost the exact same problem. Sun Zhangshan was officially absolute leader of the Constitutional Protection Movement, but all his power and armies came from the support of Tang Jiao and Lu Rongting. Tang and Lu wanted to negotiate, arguing that Duan's resignation meant they'd already won. But Sun considered all the warlords equally bad, and insisted they couldn't stop until they took Beijing. Both armies stalled in Hunan for months, until the Jili finally got fed up and renewed the attack. The new army under Cao Kun and Wu Peifu was initially successful, and Hunan was taken. But on the border of Guangdong, Wu Peifu suddenly stopped his advance and called for peace negotiations. Possibly, again, to retain his own forces. His only explanation was, although military men are duty-bound to obey orders, they must also weigh the advantages and disadvantages in order to follow suitably. This would not be disobedience. Lu and Tong really wanted to negotiate at this point, but Sun still wasn't having it. So they called an extraordinary session of parliament, which replaced the office of Generalissimo with a committee led by them. In May 1918, they kicked out Sun, who fled to Shanghai. The South was ready to talk peace. Unfortunately, Duan was back in the North. Duan's resignation had only been service level. He was followed by three weak, short-lived premiers, who were all Anhui Flick members. And then in March 1918, he managed to be re-elected. They couldn't fight, and they couldn't make peace, so the war dragged on. Eventually, in October, Feng proposed a compromise. His term as president was ending, so he would not seek re-election if Duan agreed to step down on the same day. This was not a good plan. Both men were succeeded by nobodies, Chen Nengsheng and Xu Shichang, who Duan could totally control. But the officers in the field mostly aligned themselves with the Jili, so they still refused to attack. In 1919, the war just kind of fizzled out. The Guomindang members in the south supported Sun by boycotting parliament, so Luantong just dissolved it, de facto ending the constitutional protection movement. We'll follow up with Sun's next move soon, but next time I want to take a moment to look at what's going on farther out. It's revolution on the periphery. Like and subscribe so you don't miss it. Thanks for watching.